Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode. And I've got a really fantastic guest for you today, Fletcher Ellingson. He's the author of The Practice of Feeling Good in Business and Life. He's got a great book that I just finished reading. We're going to talk all about it. And so I'm really happy to have him on the show. So Fletcher, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me on, Chris. Appreciate the time. Yeah, I start off by what inspired you, your journey, you inspired inspiration for the book, and I'm really excited to dive into the meat of the combo. Yeah, yeah. So basically what I do is I help people change the way they think in order to produce outstanding results in their health, wealth, and relationships. And so when we talk about changing the way we think, we're talking about laying new neural pathways in the brain, right? So we can produce, rearrange that circuitry in the brain, if you will. And so I help people who are struggling financially or emotionally or uh, in a relationship. And usually what is at the very core of it every single time is our thinking. And our thinking is this thing that is happening all of the time. And we just don't even, we're not really aware of it. I don't know if you ever heard that, that joke about there's two, two fish swimming along in the ocean and they're just swimming along next to each other, having a just a regular day. And one of them looks over at the other and says, Hey, how's the water today? And the other fish says, what's water, right? It's so our thinking is it's happening all the time without a permission, consent or approval. And we're not even just, a, we're not even aware of this thing that we're swimming in all the time. And so the inspiration for the book and my practice really was born out of a meeting. I used to be in a sales position and I was meeting with getting in front of thousands of people all over the country. And I began to recognize that these people were having the same issues. And so there were these patterns that I was recognizing. And I really believe that as a human, that is one of our greatest superpowers is pattern recognition. And you're a physician, so you probably are aware of that. Like physicians, one of their greatest assets is their ability to recognize patterns. And, and so I began coaching people and I realized that, wow, Everybody thinks that they have these unique problems. They are unique to, they are unique. Everyone has their own spin. But at the end of the day, these issues are pretty common to all of us. And so as I began coaching people, I realized that, oh, there's a certain methodology that if we walk a person through, they really do come out with a new and desire, the new desired result that they, the desired re result that they want to have. Mm -hmm. And one of my clients one time said to me like, Fletcher, when are you going to write your book? Writing a book was never on my radar. In fact, I had some limiting beliefs about that. I was like, oh, a book? Oh my gosh, I, that's not possible. But then it just became this thing that kept on nudging at me. And I wanted to document some of these thoughts. And it's really like an introductory book for personal development and really up intentionally upgrading your thinking. Yeah, one thing that was really interesting was when I was reading the book, it was really sparked was this uh, idea that you can upgrade your belief system and basically just how I always have this mantra of always continuous improvement every year, you know, you got to get better, um, which is interesting. Like your thinking is like software. A lot of the, a lot of people say positive psychology, but how do you maintain practice of feeling good when like, for example, we had COVID and we got a recession and interest rates and we got wars and I'm like, how, how do you maintain this sense of, how do you deal with it? That is such an excellent question. Thank you for asking it. What is right in the world is always available to us as is what is going wrong, right? It depends on where you place your focus. I'll give you, uh, I, I, you'll probably remember this from the book, uh, but I'll just give it uh, this quick example for your, for your audience. Imagine you're going to a movie theater to watch this uh, movie that's been advertising. You're like, oh, I really want to see that. You've been waiting for a couple months and it finally arrives to your town and you go in there and you grab your popcorn and your drink and you're waiting for the movie to uh, start. And suddenly it comes up and let's pretend that movie starts off with this intense action sequence. So maybe there's a car chase, maybe there's guns, maybe there's just a lot of high adrenaline action. Well, at that moment in time, you're not even eating your popcorn or drinking your soda. You are like glued to the screen. You're probably not re even reclined. You're probably sitting up slightly forward towards the screen. And if we could hook you up to a heart rate monitor, you'd notice that your heart rate has actually sped up. Okay. And, and then in a couple of minutes, that scene subsides. 
And now you go into something that's more lighthearted and comedic and you're chuckling to yourself and, and smiling. And then in five or 10 minutes later, there's another action sequence and your heart rate spikes again. And then maybe 20 minutes later, there's a, a romantic scene and you're swooning and feeling romantic, right? And then another 10 minutes into it, something tragic happens to the protagonist. And now you're weeping, right? You're just like, tears are rolling down. And at the end of this two hour movie, it's quite possible that you've experienced a greater range of emotion than you have all week long. And the amazing thing about this is that you were having an emotional reaction to something that is not even real. It's just light on a screen. But the brain has a, is, has a challenging time distinguishing between what's real and what's not. Mm -hmm. And all the brain, what the brain must do is it must create a chemical reaction, which is called it, which is an emotion based on where you place your focus. To answer your excellent question, how do we practice this? It's a matter of practicing where you're placing your focus. Mm -hmm. Most of us are practiced, and, and you tell me if, you, if this makes sense. Would you agree that most of us are practiced at focusing on the things that don't feel good in life? Yeah. We're, yeah, we're focused on what's not working. We're focused on the guy who, or the driver who cuts us off suddenly, or the, who, what's not going well politically, or what's not going well in the family, or what's not going well in the weather. We're, <laughs> we're practiced at focusing on all of these things, and the brain doesn't care what you're focused on. Its job simply is to create a chemical reaction that aligns with the thing you're focused on. And so the opportunity, and it's a very exciting opportunity, is to learn how to begin to feel good on demand by becoming intentional about where we're placing our focus. Chris, I used to wake up years ago, I used to wake up early, and the first thing I'd do is I'd turn on the radio and, and listen to the news. Okay, I thought I was being informed and it was responsible of me. And then in 10 minutes, you get up and just an earful of what's going wrong in the world who died, who got killed, who, who got shot up, who fires, all this kind of stuff. And then what would I do? I would go into the kitchen where my wife was preparing her tea or breakfast. And I would say, babe, you're never going to believe what I just heard. So I would dump all of this poison into her world. And she's babe, why are you telling me all this? I said, Don't, aren't you outraged about it? Uh, it, it? It came to my attention that, oh my gosh, I'm starting my day off with adrenaline and cortisol at high levels. I don't feel good. And it's because of what I was focused on. So years ago, I cut out listening to the news and that was one of the best decisions. Now, some people say, but Fletcher, don't you want to stay informed? You know what? We have so many ways of getting content that's important to us. The content that I want is important to me. It finds its way to me. I don't need to start my day off with all the terrible things that are going on in the world. And that was a great decision for me, by the way. Yeah, I love that. I love that story where you place your focus and we can, when, one thing I loved about the book again, referencing the book was you can create because basically uh, what I've noticed is like on social media, like Twitter or whatever, like yeah. the same information, one person can interpret it one way and then the same exact information, another person can interpret it a totally different reality. So it's like we we are actually the creators of our own uh, universe. So um, I love that you said that. Yeah. We, our brains are meaning making machines. And just as you said, yes, we create our own realities. Yeah. And some people listening to this may say, Fletcher is really whack. There's no <laughs> way we are creating our own. I guarantee you it's people have conversations all the time and they walk away with completely different interpretations. Is that accurate? Yeah. Or just like my wife will be, sometimes will be like, you said this. And I was like, I did not say I'd like, I, <laughs> Honestly, had no re like. I'm not denying it. I don't recall saying, but she interprets it as I said this. Is. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so, while a lot of people are saying, "Oh my God, the world's going to hell in a handbasket," okay, that's one story, and you can find as much evidence to support that as you want. Um, Another radical idea, and when I say radical, I define radical as a departure from the norm, a departure from what's usual. Our, another radical idea about the world is this is the most exciting and best time in the history of our planet. 
We have great, we have access to more food. We have access to greater medical care. We have access to more knowledge and wisdom, more experience, more travel. We have greater experience to more awareness than ever before. This is the greatest time in history. Are there still tragedies and hardships? Absolutely. Is it heartbreaking? Absolutely. But where you place your focus is going to determine the quality of your day. Yeah. The other thing that I, I get quite often is we'll talk about the glass ceiling, but we all experience emotional trauma and just people that really experience like either war or they got their house destroyed or they got to leave a country or rape or abuse or um, just racism, all these yes. things. Like, how do you make sense of that? And how does someone recover from these extremely traumatic experiences? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Man, that is a good question. First of all, yeah, absolutely. When, when people go through devastating traumas like that, my sincere desire is that they have access to professional help, right? People who are going to help them process their thinking. Mm -hmm. But again, it all comes down to thinking. If, you, if you've read the book by Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, right? Here's somebody who's in the worst case scenario of his, of his life, finds beauty. Now, I'm not saying that's easy. I'm not saying I could do it. But it goes to show that, again, it comes down to our thinking. Look at Nelson Mandela, who was locked away for a quarter of a century in prison. If, I had, if that had been me, I would have come out there and I would have wanted revenge. I would have wanted vengeance. I would have been calling for an uprising. But here he comes out and he's... His commitment is greater than ever to, cr to create a sense of peace. Same thing with Gandhi, right? Here he is. He's been beaten to an inch of his life multiple times. People hate him, people dying around him. But the thing he does is he creates a story and becomes peace. He, he, the story, he's not just preaching peace. He becomes that peace. He be, begins to create a story that people who are doing this to him and his people he believes that they are doing the best they can with their programming, with their tools. So he has literally compassion for his oppressors. And he sits, and that is what allows him to sit across from the people who hate him and wish for his death, is his thinking. It's an amazing and inspiring concept when we really get to our thinking determines our destiny. Uh, it reminds me of when you, while you were talking, it's like, the people that suffer very early on, they have the great, they have the ability to make the greatest impact because they can make the greatest meaning out of their suffering for, so that other future doesn't have to go through what they had to do. And similar to you're writing a book or coach, coaches, people trying to help people um, and, and improve the uh, human consciousness. I so, love what you just said, Chris. You said the people who have suffered the greatest have the opportunity to create the greatest meaning out of their suffering in order to help others. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what real leaders do. In my opinion, leaders do two things. And leaders influence the thinking of those people that, that, that they're leading. They influence the thinking of others and they enroll them into a vision of what is possible. And mm -hmm. that's when we see people like Gandhi, Nelson, Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa, right? Brene Brown, uh, Oprah Winfrey, all these wonderful people in our world. What they're doing is they're enrolling people into a vision of what is possible for our planet. Yeah, I, I really love that. I know we have around seven minutes left and uh, a kind of a difficult question is how do you forgive? How do you forgive? How do you let go of the past? Uh, you know, we talked about really traumatic things. How do you forgive that and let go and, and move on? Okay. Yeah. This is a, so there's two parts to this. Number one is there's a lot of talk about forgiveness in our world. And at, I get the concept of forgiveness, but at the core of forgiveness, what you're doing is you're dropping your judgment of that person. You're dropping your judgment. When we forgive, we stop judging. So we could even, we could get rid of the need for forgiveness if we simply stopped judging so much. Mm. Now, but people are saying, oh, but Fletcher, be realistic. You know, that person stole money from me. That person oppressed me. That person uh, injured me. I get it. I've had terrible things happen to me personally. 
And I, and for years judged the heck out of them. And guess what? Those people weren't in my life and I was still suffering. Why was I suffering? Because my judgment was keeping me in the path. My judgment was poisoning me. When I came to the realization that person who had wronged me, wronged is in quotation marks there, but when I came to the realization that was their best thinking at the moment, they were If I had lived in their shoes and had every single thing that had happened to them happen to me, I would have done the same things as that person. That was their programming. They were doing the best they can. You know, some people, Fletcher, come on. That was, they were, what they did was illegal. What they did was hurtful. I get it. They were acting out of their programming. And that's why when we drop our judgment, it, it gives us access to compassion and empathy. So number one is we stop judging. And number two, again, is the practice of redirecting our focus. Mm -hmm. Because the the brain, without you stepping in, it's going to just go to the easiest solution. They're wrong and I'm right. And let's just judge the heck out of them. That's 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 what the brain is going to do. We're conditioned to do that. We have to get radical. Again, a departure from the norm. We have to step in and say, where do I want to place my focus? What do I want to believe about the situation? What meaning can I bring to this situation? Now, I'm not denying that it didn't feel good. It hurt. I got it. There was suffering. But what do I want to, out of this situation, what do I want to create that serves instead of hinders and injures? Yeah, I really love that. Dropping and uh, dropping the judgment and it's really uh, very useful. How can, and then the other kind of question, because we're a business entrepreneurship and a lot of the audience are success minded and we always hear about this glass ceiling and you were talking about you never thought you had it in it to write a book and people are up for a promotion or kind of yeah. you talk about winning the big game and kind of their old negative programming holds them back. How do you defeat self-sabotage and yeah. also break to the next level? Yeah. Awesome. Excellent <laughs> question. I'll make this quick. Number one, we want to create a sense of momentum. Okay. Mm. Because when we're, when we have momentum, it's easy for us to achieve our desired results. The only time that you can, that you will experience this thing called momentum is when your thinking is in alignment with your desired outcome. Mm. See, when your thinking is no longer in alignment, now what you're experiencing is this thing called resistance and you won't take the necessary steps to achieve your desired outcome. So what we have to do is reprogram the brain, right? So I'm a big believer in affirmations. Some people, oh, really? Just repeating the same? No, it's greater than that. Language matters. We use language to create every bit of our world. Every bit of our experience of this world, we are using language, mm-hmm. okay? When you didn't have the job that you currently have, you used language to get it. You said, you literally made a declaration at one point, I'm leaving this job and I'm going to get another job. It couldn't have happened without language. So we have to really tap into the power of language and realize that. So when you, so when the person says, gosh, I want to make $500,000 and you know, you can say that, but then listen to the internal monologue. Come on, get real Fletcher. That's not possible. You've never come close to that. That language is, it takes you out of momentum. And so what do we have to do? Again, get radical, take baby steps. We have to reframe everything. I've seen other people generate large quantities of wealth. I know other people personally that have done it. Oh, I see the steps they've done. Oh, I could take some of those steps. We begin to ease ourselves into another way of thinking that is aligned with the desired outcome. Okay. And then I'm, I, I, again, create some sort of mantras that like, I have lots of them. Like I'm resourceful, capable, flexible. That's what I always remind myself, right? I'm resourceful, capable, flexible. So when my thinking is no longer in alignment, I remind myself, oh yeah, I'm resourceful, capable, flexible. All that I need is within me now. Good things are lined up, stacked up and showing up daily, right? These are all things I say on a regular basis. And now I believe it. I have, and a belief is simply a sense of certainty. That's all a belief is. So get certain about what is possible. Yeah, I, I love that. And it's like, anytime, like, for example, just my life when like breaking through that glass ceiling, I have to really, really monitor like my thoughts and where my awareness is and where my emotions is. And it's almost like sometimes just showing up that's going to seal the deal. 
or yes. just or just make sure you get enough rest so you're not tired and that sort of thing. And just and you have to really put your awareness whenever you're close to that glass ceiling because you really have to. And then once you break through it, and it's, then you're on to the next level. Interesting. How can people find out more about you? I know your book and it's on Amazon and encourage yes. the audience to check it out and work with you, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to learn more, go to FletcherEllingson.com or ThePracticeOfFeelingGood.com. Either one of them will take you to my website. You can uh, grab a copy of my book, The Practice of Feeling Good on Amazon, or there's a link to it on my website as well. Check me out on Facebook. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. And Chris, I really want to acknowledge you for all the good you're putting out in the world. I love the podcasting world because, again, this is an opportunity for people to bring goodness into the world where there's so much tumul tumultuous upset going happening. It's people like you who are showing up and spreading the good news that, that life is actually whatever we want to make of it. Yeah. I really, I created this podcast to allow people to have a platform to share their six and just to share it. And it's grown tremendously. And I love your work is using emotion to, to harness that into your desired potential, your desired dreams. And for all the audience, be sure to give Fletcher's socials. You can follow it, check out a book. It is really a fantastic book. And just talking about rewiring, just the way you look at your nervous system, your thinking, your emotions, beliefs, thoughts, habits, and your destiny. And I really enjoyed having you on and, and keep up the great work. Thanks so much, Chris. I appreciate it.